Genesis. <clears throat> Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1. God is a really good God. And we have the purpose in our hearts to love him with every strength and fiber of our being. And I pray today that the Lord will give us something that will really bless each and every person. In Genesis chapter 1 verse 1 it says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. God created the heavens and the earth. The earth is God's creation. So, you know, I had someone ask me a question about what is sin? What is salvation? Why do I need salvation? So, if God created the heavens and the earth, then it's God who gets to set the rules and the regulations of how we are supposed to live in the earth. Turn to Psalms. I want to give you two or three witnesses. Psalms 24. It's a blessing and an honor to be able to get into the Word of God and even have the Word of God. Psalms 24. Let's, let's start at verse 1. It says, The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. So the earth and everything in the earth belongs to God who created the earth and they that dwell in it. So they who dwell in the earth also belongs to the Lord, not to the devil. Okay? For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the floods. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? Or who shall stand in his holy place? He that has clean hands, a pure heart, who have not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully. He shall receive the blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the Lord of his salvation. He shall receive the blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. Now let's turn to Acts. Acts chapter 17. This used to be one of my favorite scriptures. So if the earth belongs to the Lord, and the fullness thereof belongs to the Lord, then, and he created the earth, then he has a right to establish how we are supposed to function and operate in the earth. Acts chapter 17, look at verse 24. Are you there? All right. It says, verse 24, God that made the world, here's another witness, God made the world, he created the world, and all things therein. See that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwells not in temples made with hands. So no church building, no temple made of hands, brick mortar, God resides there. God resides in people. Okay? Neither is worship with men's hands, no idols, no image that anybody can, can create with their hands and then bow down to, God is not there, okay? It says, neither is worship with men's hands as though he, as though he needed anything, seeing he gives to all life and breath and all things. And has made of one blood. This is one of the points I really wanted to make because I think it's foolishness and it's downright evil for the Sadducees and the scribes and the Pharisees, the spirit that's in people today who was in people during the time that Jesus walked, 
would take the position that Jesus came to this earth and he only came for the Hebrews or the Israelites. And that continues to be a fight, a controversy, and no matter how much you show in scriptures, people don't want to accept this fact. So this scripture is saying, and he has made of one blood human beings, all nations of men, for to dwell on all the face of the earth and has determined God who created the heavens and the earth has determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation that they should seek the Lord. The purpose God created human beings for is that they should seek the Lord if happily they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. For in him, God, we live and move and have our being, as certain also of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. God determines where you live, what time in history you were born, where you work, everything about your life. He knows how many hairs on your head, they are numbered. There's nothing about you that God is unaware of. And we need to allow God to be God. Am I making sense to you? Turn to Luke, Luke chapter 20. I don't know everything. I'm not trying to know everything. I only know what God reveals to me. And I only can give you what he gives to me in Luke chapter 20. Thank you, Father. This is a parable of the vineyard. It says, then, verse 9, then began he, Jesus, to speak to the people this parable. A certain man planted a vineyard and led it forth to husbandmen and went into a far country for a long time. And at the season he sent a servant to the husbandmen that they should give him of the fruit of the vineyard. But the husbandmen beat him and sent him away empty. And again he sent another servant, and they beat him also, and entreated him shamefully, and sent him away empty. And again he sent a third, and they wounded him also, and cast him out. Then said the Lord of the vineyard, What shall I do? I will send my beloved son. So we know this is the father talking about the earth. He sent his son, Jesus. It may be that they reverence him when they see him. But when the husbandmen saw him, they reasoned among themselves, saying, this is the heir. Because Jesus died to make, give us an inheritance. So Jesus was the heir of the father who created and owns the earth and everything in the earth. I pray that this is simple enough for everybody to get. Come let us kill him, that the inheritance may be ours. So Jesus Christ came in the world to bring us back to God the Father, but the devil and those who are worshiping the devil, and I don't care if you Jew, Hebrew, white, brown, black, blue, yellow, whatever color you are, if you worship in Lucifer or Satan, you fit into this category, let us kill him that the inheritance may be ours. So you have people on the earth now who's worshiping Satan because they are deceived by Satan into believing that Satan is the creator of the earth. And they're trying to kill those who are worshiping the sun. Because it's only through the sun that we are able to receive an inheritance, and that inheritance is eternal salvation, and that we will reign and rule with Christ in the new heaven and the new earth, which I'm not trying to get into today. 
15. So they cast him out of the vineyard and killed him. What therefore shall the Lord of the vineyard do unto them? He shall come and destroy these husbandmen and shall give the vineyard to others. And when they heard it, they said, God forbid. And he beheld them and said, What is this then that is written? It's already written. The stone which the builders rejected, the original Hebrews who Jesus came to rejected the stone. The same has become the head of the corner. Whosoever shall fall upon the stone shall be broken. But whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. So when we fall on Jesus, who is the rock, the stone, he breaks us. He breaks the old sin nature off of us because we fall on him on purpose. We exercise our free will to choose to fall at our feet, fall on his at, on our knees, at his feet, to worship him, to honor him, to exalt him, to magnify him, to have him cleanse us, redeem us, wash us, create in us a new creation in Christ Jesus. When that happens on purpose, we're not going to be pulverized or broken. But those who reject him, this scripture says, whosoever, whosoever shall fall upon the stone, shall be broken but whomsoever it shall fall it will be grind to powder you see it this is the scriptures this is written in red so we understand we've been programmed and conditioned to believe this is jesus speaking when we read it in red so my bible has this written in red this is the words of the son that the father who created and made the heaven and the earth and everything in it it's him who is speaking? Am I making sense to you? Now let's turn to Psalms again, Psalms 2. Because this is, you got people who are saying, I don't need to ask for forgiveness for my sin. What is sin? Sin is going against God's instructions of how we're supposed to live in this earth that he created. Is this clear enough? All right, let's look at chapter 2, verse 3. And this is what people today are saying. And this has been predicted that what the people was going to say. Verse 3, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. They don't want to be controlled by God. They don't want to be led by God. They want to do their own thing. All right. Let's turn to Galatians. I don't want to be proselytized. I believe the Bible is the word of God. I'm going to live according to it the best of my strength and understanding. I understand there's some supernatural things taking place, but thanks be to God, a lot of it he had already taught me. So in Galatians 3, and if we have the living Holy Spirit in us, he will lead us and guide us into all of God's truth. God's truth, okay? God's truth, not man's truth. I'm not interested in becoming a part of another type of religion. I believe in the Messiah. I believe the Bible is an inspired word of God for correction, for reproof, and for doctrine. I'm doing the best I know and understand how to be a witness for the Most High God. All right? Galatians chapter 3. I'm not picking and choosing what part I'm going to believe. Verse 13. Christ has redeemed us. Redeem means to buy back. Because when Adam and Eve sinned, the world that God created fell. The sin nature was birthed into the earth. And every human being who came in the world after Adam and Eve came in the world spiritually disconnected from God the Father. And that's why Jesus came in the earth to die. He was a blood sacrifice to redeem us, to buy us back with his blood, that we would have a relationship with God the Father and have eternal salvation. All right? 
Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone that hangs on a tree. Jesus hung on a tree. That the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Jesus died not to make us financially rich. Jesus died to give us eternal salvation and to redeem us, to buy us back. I'm sure a lot of people understand when you go to a pawn shop, you don't have enough money, so you have a piece of valuable. You take it into the shop. They give you some a little bit of money for the whatever the item is. Then when you go back to redeem the item, you get the item back in, in exchange for the money you get you got from the people. Well, Christ poured out his blood to pay us back from Adam and Eve giving us away to the enemy. Am I making sense? Is this clear? No. All right. Let's turn to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Let's look at verse 19. And what I'm about to say now, I think is extremely important. Verse 19 says, What? Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which you have of God? And you, this underline, you are not your own. You're not your own. If you be in Christ, if you be in the Messiah, you are not your own. You're exchanging your life for his life. So that means that you have to start living for him, not for you. For you are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body. Once you've been bought with a price, your whole mission is to bring glory and honor to God in your body and in your spirit, which belongs to God. Do you all see this? Honestly, do you see it? You are not your own. You've been bought with a price. For you've been bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and your spirit, which belongs to God. You are God's, which is it's God's. Apostrophe means ownership. Your spirit and your body belongs to God. You are not your own. You've been bought with a price. Can you see it? Let's turn to Acts again. This is probably going to be a short message. I just want to make my points today. Acts chapter 20. is really coming against us today. Acts chapter 20. Look at verse 28. It says, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers. To feed the church of God, which he has purchased with his own blood. So this is clear. God the Father, through the shed blood of his Son, purchased the church. Purchased the flock with his own blood. Do you see it? For I know this, that after my departing, Paul speaking, shall grievous woes enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves, even within your own Hebrew selves, shall men arise speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. Therefore, watch and remember that by the space of three years, Paul speaking, I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. 
Do you all see this? It can't get any clearer than this. The church, the flock, the people. Jesus died for whosoever, anyone who will believe that Jesus Christ came in the flesh. Turn to Hebrews 9. I, I told you I was going to give you a lot of witnesses. I'm giving you the verses, the scriptures, the word of God. Hebrews 9. Hebrews 9, look at verse 12. It says, Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, talking about Jesus, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. So it's clear he shed his blood, he entered into the holy place once to obtain eternal redemption for us. For if the blood in the law of bulls and goats and ashes of an heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifies to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Bulls and goats couldn't sanctify us. We are under a new covenant and we have been bought with a price, the shed blood of Jesus. We are not our own. And because we are not our own, you're being deceived. If you continue to live your life, the way you did live your life before you became a believer in the Messiah and the Anointed One, in Christ, the Anointed One. That's what Christ means, anointed. Okay? If you're still living and you're doing, still doing all of the same things, you're still defiling your soul and your temple, you're being deceived. Because you're not your own. If something supernatural has happened in your life, you should be thirsty and hungry to understand and know your Redeemer. You should want to know Him. You should want to be able to discern His Spirit and His voice. Because without discerning His Spirit and, your, and, and His voice, you're leaning to your own understand to navigate through life. And, and God did not send His Son for it to be that way. He sent His Son so that His Holy Spirit can live on the inside of us and lead us and guide us and teach us into all truth. Jesus Christ is truth according to the scriptures. I don't know any other truth besides the truth of the living God written in this book. You only can know God through knowing his word. His word cleanses us. The word washes. The word cleanses. The word transforms our mind and renew our mind when we regulate and discipline our lives based on the instructions in his word. So if you don't know his word, you're not going to be renewed and you're not going to change the way you live. If you're going to a church where the music is catering to your flesh and you bumping and you grinding and you popping your fingers and you're not being given any word, you're just going to a social event. You're not being taught how to be holy, how to be righteous, how to put the flesh under subjection because the enemy is able to afflict you, lead you, guide you in your flesh. In your flesh, he can seduce you and bait you and lure you away from God. But if you're walking according to the Spirit, the words of God, he said, they are spirit and they are life. So if this word is leading you and guiding you, it's not going to lead you and guide you into sinning. If you understand that you've been bought with a price and you're not your own, then you should no longer be living to please the flesh. There's a war going on between the flesh and and the spirit, they are at war with each other. The Lord God lives in our spirit. The flesh is the physical you that is still operating in this dimension. You, by your spirit being renewed, have power and authority over your flesh. 
So if your flesh say I'm tired and I don't want to go anywhere and I don't want to fellowship with the saints, your spirit can say you need to go. Which one you obey is the one who have authority and power and rule over you. You have more power than you realize. Turn to 1 Corinthians. Uh, let's see where I want to go. The kingdom of God has power. 15. I'll first out. No, I'm sorry, 4. 1 Corinthians 4. Thank you, Jesus. 1 Corinthians chapter 4. And look at verse, most people don't know this verse of scripture even exists. Verse 20. For the kingdom of God is not in word, but in power. The kingdom of God in you, the Holy Ghost in you, has power to overcome the works of darkness. To resist darkness. Submit to God. Resist the devil. And he'll have to flee from you. But you can't resist the devil without first submitting to God. Doing it God's way. Drawing near to him. And pureness of heart. And holiness. And righteousness. You got to be holy and you got to be righteous. And you got to be close to God. In order to be able to affect change in the world. In order to be able to bind up and, and protect yourself from the wiles of the devil. The full armor of God. The shield of faith. You can't have faith unless you hear in the word. Hear in the word. Hear in the word. The word cleanses. The word transforms. The word renews. The word gives you power to resist the devil. God's kingdom in you is real. If you, if you yield to him. If you fight against the urges of the flesh. And allow the Holy Spirit of God to rule and reign in your life. That should be an honor to us if we've been born again. Now I want to switch gears a little bit and tell you a little bit about what the gospel is. Because most people don't know what the gospel is. Let's turn to 1 Corinthians 15. The word gospel means good news. Good news is not that you're going to be rich. <laughs> but good news is that when you, when you die, your soul is not going to go to hell. The enemy has convinced people that hell and heaven are not real. You believe it by faith. God says it's impossible to, to please him without faith. So by faith, I'm going to live my life on this earth like I want to avoid hell. And the gospel is, 1 Corinthians 15, 1, the gospel that Paul preached, because the gospel, we are under grace. We are no longer, I believe, under law. And that doesn't mean that we have freedom to sin. We are held to a higher standard being under grace because the living God now is on the inside of us. And we ought to understand that everything we think or do that displeases God, he's right here in us. And that should matter to us. We shouldn't want to sin. We shouldn't want to take God's presence in us in places that you know God wouldn't be pleased in going to. Or you shouldn't commit acts that you know God wouldn't be pleased in you committing. God is not happy when we sin. Because he gave us a way out. The Holy Spirit of God is strong enough. The power of God is strong enough to help us to not sin against God. And I want to make that clear, okay? Verse 1 says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you have received, wherein you stand, by which also you are saved by believing in this gospel. If you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, I, Paul, received from Christ, how that Christ died for our sins, 
according to the scriptures. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures that he was buried. This is what you got to believe. This is what the gospel is. And that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures and that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. And this is not the gospel, but I'm going to add this. That he was seen above 500 brethren at once. After he had been crucified, 500 people saw Jesus alive again at once. They all together saw him at once. And some are still alive at the time of this writing. Paul's writing. Am I making sense to you today? You can't live in your kind of way. And we're living in some times when witches and warlocks and sorcerers are coming hard after the people of God. And if you lukewarm, the enemy is going to take you out prematurely. The enemy wants to steal, kill, and destroy as many people's souls as he can. But we are here to do God's bidding in the earth. That means we have to have such a close walk with him that he'll, we'll know when he's telling us to turn to the left or to the right. No witch, no wizard, no warlock is mightier and stronger than the power of God operating in a real believer's life. You might be afflicted. You might get one of the fiery darts might come against you, but you need to get up and keep moving forward. And we need to pray for each other. Pray without ceasing. We've been instructed to pray without ceasing. Praying always with all kinds of prayer. Praying all the time. These words are not in the scripture just to be filling in the Bible. They're telling us what we need to do. But we've been so programmed to watch TV all the time or listen to music all the time or watch, go out and have fun and have a good time. We are not interested in understanding and living in a way that like we've been bought with a price. We don't live like we are not our own. We continue to do what we want to do to the point that no one really comes together too much to pray and worship God and honor God and seek the face of God. Acts 17, 26 should be all of our beliefs. We should all say it's in him we live, move, and have our beings. That's what a born again, Holy Ghost fell, bought with the blood of Jesus Christ person should be doing. It's not about what you eat and your hair and all of it. It's about your heart, the inner you, the part of you that believes or not believes. Am I making sense to you all today? God is good. God is real. And he needs a people right now in this particular time in history who's going to represent him in holiness and righteousness, who's not going to be lukewarm, but be genuine for him. Who is hearing his spirit and his voice speak, not necessarily in an audible voice, but you know when you know God, his voice, when he's speaking to you. Because there's dying people hurting people, broken people, who need God's representatives in the earth to be reflective of his power in the earth. And you're not going to get that leading to your own understanding. You only can get it when God empowers it to you or imparts it to you. And you can't get it from another human being. You only can get it from God. And you get it by seeking him for yourselves. The preacher, the pastor, the evangelist, nobody is anointed enough to help you do what God only can help you do. It's on each individual believer to seek God for him or herself. To have a personal relationship where God can lead and guide you for yourselves. And I want to encourage everyone today to pray for wisdom and discernment. For without wisdom and discernment, you will be led by a counterfeit spirit 
and you can be led straight to hell. So I pray that this makes a difference for you. Let's go to Romans chapter 1. And this is who Paul was when he walked on the earth. Verse 1. Romans 1 verse 1. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God, which he had promised a fool by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning everything as concerning his son Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh. Jesus came in the flesh according to the seed of David and declared to be the son of God with power, with power. We live like we don't have any power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead by whom we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name among whom are you also called you also the called of Jesus Christ we are the called of Jesus Christ Jesus Christ died for all who would believe. That's what I believe. I don't want to be proselytized away from that belief. That's my, I'm exercising my personal free will to believe in the Messiah. I don't believe that I am supposed to live according to the Old Testament laws. I believe that I am under a new covenant. I believe I've been bought with a price. That I'm not my own that I'm supposed to live and walk in holiness and righteousness. And that's what I'm doing. And I don't need anybody to try to move me away from that belief. I don't, I'm not embracing a new way of believing. I believe that is the way. I am a believer in the Messiah. Christ means anointed one. <laughs> and I believe the Messiah was the anointed son of the Most High God. And I believe that I only can be made right with the Father by believing in the fact that he came in the flesh and he died and he rose up on the third day. And when I live lawlessly, I'm committing sin. When I'm going against the instructions of the word, I'm committing sin. I rely on the Holy Spirit of the living God to bring corrections to me. And I instruct or, or advise all of you to rely on the word of God. Don't take anybody's word. Get in the word for yourselves. Okay? All right.